as the background for this, when uh, I was asked uh, kindly by Gordon and uh, Shondell and, and Gordon Price to talk, uh, I reflected on all the good times I had working uh, with Warren. Uh, we spent a lot of time working on the Great Northern Way uh, Trust, which SFU, UBC, Emily Carr, and uh, BCIT jointly owned. And Warren was a real joy to, to work with uh, there. And um, he was always fun, as Joanne said. You can't mention Warren without having a smile on your face. So when Gordon asked me to do this, they sent me, this is what we expect you to do. And um, I hope I will raise questions and uh, not just live up to the, the letter of the intent, but also keep the spirit and uh, in, certainly in keeping with Warren's humor. So here we go. Um, maybe I should start by telling you the titles we didn't go for in this. <laughs> Um, Gordon, as he said, tried to rein me in a bit, but the original title I had, which he quickly vetoed, was Vancouver, a world-class city, and then I had two taglines. First was, you gotta be kidding, and secondly, not by a long shot. So we, we made it a much more uh, civilized, and I will try to stick with that, but I know in questions, I'll get out of hand. It's just not possible to stick to the knitting. Me and Mr. Trump have that in common. I hope that's the only thing we have in common. Um, what I want to look at the, is the regional context. And we, uh, in Vancouver, have a 50-year history uh, since the, the first regional plan, really, in, in 1968. Uh, there used to be something called the Low Mangaland Regional Planning Board, which went all the way out to Hope. and. Um, it was replaced in the late 60s by a series of regional districts which spanned the province. Uh, the one in, in Vancouver uh, was originally the Greater Vancouver Regional District, now called Metro. And the first plan for the region was in 1975, and it was uh, supported by a supplementary plan uh, on regional town centers. The idea was, and to this day, I think it's, uh, it's quite prescient when you realize that uh, 40 odd years later, um, we're still trying to live up to the tenets of that plan. But the idea was there were a bunch of regional town centers, they'd be connected by transit, and uh, we would have growth around these centers, uh, leave room for agricultural land and open space in between the town centers, and that way we preserve land and also create uh, or preserve the livability. And I think that what we've been trying to do ever since is fill in that plan. Uh, it was updated in 1989, and uh, then it was updated again with the, the regional uh, plan in 2011 called Shaping Our Future, uh, all building on this same idea. And I think the plan was terrific. Uh, the problem was, uh, for a number of reasons, we've had trouble getting there. So let's see why. Uh, does that do it? Yeah, okay. So first, we've been endowed with great natural beauty, and we've traded on that for a very long time, and I think we've traded too much on it. Uh, we've also had great planning, particularly at the, at the regional level, where we were, uh, I think, a real pathbreaker, starting when you realize we had this regional planning board in 1961, and then formally the creation of regional districts. And there's been a huge commitment to maintaining and uh, where possible enhancing the environment. And I think we've, we've really done that over the nearly 50 years that I've lived here. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, for the young people in the audience who are doing this for a living in the future, there's a lot to be done to make this a really great uh, city. I think we have lots of the building blocks, and I think we have uh, many, many moons to go. Uh, the, first, the future, one theme here is going to be that it lies in the past. And almost all the ideas we need are tried and true ideas, and I'll show some of them are hundreds of years old. And what I want to do is combine those with some other ideas about city building to see where we can take the city going forward. Now, we've had a number of successes, uh, and I think uh, particularly when this new transit-oriented development, TOD, uh, certainly places like Metrotown, as it's grown on both sides of the railroad tracks, Brentwood, uh, Surrey City Center, Coquitlam, 
really have become, uh, I think, exemplars of, of how to do that. You notice Vancouver is not included in there, and that's on purpose. Uh, we've also been a pioneer in putting housing back in the central city and regenerating uh, life and not just having offices that close at 5 o'clock and the city is abandoned. So we've done a great job in Vancouver CBD. Uh, Surrey City Center is a whole new city center which is taking shape and I think will be very different from Vancouver's and another model uh, that uh, people can follow. And places like New Westminster and, and Lower Lonsdale are also very compact city centers in their own right. Uh, creating parks, we've done uh, some notable work. We look at Cole Harbor and Falls Creek. Uh, the Spirit Trail, which will eventually leak Deep Cove, Deep Cove uh, right across to Horseshoe Bay with one continuous uh, traffic-free uh, connector by the shore. Uh, we've also had some terrific success in raising densities. Uh, I was astounded to go through Port Moody just a couple of weeks ago and see the extent to which that place has densified. Uh, Lower Lonsdale, Metrotown, and of course Cole Harbor are all examples of rising density and of the great degree of satisfaction people have living in those neighborhoods that I know that continues, and this will be part of what I'm talking about, people continue to scream about density and height, and yet when people, given the opportunity to move into dense neighborhoods with high buildings, uh, they like it and they don't move. And the other successes we've had have been in transit. We've had four lines built, uh, starting with the original SkyTrain, which was eventually extended to Surrey, and then the Evergreen Line is the most recent one. In between, we've had the Canada Line to the airport, and the the Millennium Line going out on low heat, plus the B-Line buses like the 99B. So we've done lots of really laudable things. Uh, what we haven't done, unfortunately, is uh, doing enough of them. So while we've done lots, we've, we've missed a lot of opportunities. And the transit infrastructure, which really is critical to all of this for a number of reasons I'll get into shortly, uh, really badly lags. We've uh, drastically underinvested in transit, we've overinvested in roads, and we are going to pay the price going forward. The inability of, uh, or the unwillingness of the province to fund uh, transit, I think, will cost the province significantly because without a healthy Vancouver metropolitan area, the health of the provincial economy is severely damaged. Uh, the re well, that was an unpaid political announcement. Uh, <laughs> But there'll be more of those later. As I said, my job now is better than tenure, because before I just couldn't be fired. Now I don't work. <laughs> so I am really independent. Um, until the Canada Line, uh, there really was no focus on transit-oriented development in the city of Vancouver at all. Uh, ludicrously, the Canby uh, Line planning op started the Canby study, which developed these six-story buildings along Canby Street, uh, started four months after the line was open, uh, really getting ahead of the power curve. And um, we've really been imaginative and gone up to six stories along Canby Street where you're sitting on a ridge where you're not blocking anybody's view. But that's hardly my idea of uh, transit-oriented development. Autos have dominated, and unfortunately, they're dominating more. When I read that people are planning on planning, the province is planning on having a bridge link across House Sound to the Sunshine Coast for some 40,000 people. I mean, stupid is the first word that comes to mind and other stronger ones follow. Um, it's just not where the future is and where the present is in many places. So we're only now starting to develop really robust complementary policies between transit and land use. So, I mean, here are some pictures of the successes we've had. 99B is purported by uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers to be the busiest bus line in all of North America. And people who depend on it to get out to UBC uh, find it's very difficult to get on it. This is Georgia Street at rush hour. We've hardly had a great success. My wife and I moved to the North Shore uh, eight months ago, and we find it is impossible to get off the North Shore after 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Both bridges, Lionsgate and the Second Narrows, are absolutely packed. So the only way to get here is to take sea bus, which is a great alternative, but that's part of the reality. Now, I'm going to show my two favorites. My wife said you have to have these slides. My two favorite transit-oriented development slides, um, and these slag the city, which deserves to be slagged. Um, 
First, uh, the most accessible point in Western Canada in terms of the number of people who can get there within 30 minutes, commercial and Broadway. We have a Safeway, uh, Shoppers Drug Mart, and other one-story buildings. And uh, the plan the city has put forward sees uh, up to 24 stories built in this place. Uh, hardly a way to deal with either populating the transit system or getting much ahead of the supply curve for housing. Uh, number two on my favorite list of transit-oriented development is this one right here, Broadway and Canby, a one-story subway entrance across the street. There's a Wendy's in a parking lot, and then there's a two-story uh, Taqueria on the other side. So this is not where we need to go, particularly when you consider there's going to be a crossing subway underneath Broadway, and this is also going to be an extremely accessible place. So uh, we have done some things on transit-oriented development, particularly in the city of Vancouver, we lag badly. Now, my view, uh, having grown up in New York, gone to school in, in Berkeley, and lived in some reasonably exciting places, I think push comes to shove, our city is still reasonably dull and highly controlled. Uh, we have three big problems. Housing affordability we know about. Uh, matching it is traffic and transit congestion and the very modest prog progressions we've had toward real uh, transit-oriented development. You put these three together and it's a triple whammy on affordability because affordability is both travel costs for households and occupancy costs. And the failure to put lots of housing on top of transit stations means that we've failed to provide economical travel and economic housing in large quantities. Uh, we are still blessed in Vancouver with uh, wonderful neighborhoods. Uh, NIMBY is uh, part and parcel of the uh, founding principles of the Dunbar ratepayers. And um, they're getting into the 20th century uh, slowly. And uh, when I understand there was a big fight on the Stong site to build a six-story building, and in the end they built a four-and-a-half-story building. Uh, four stories on the high part of the hill and five stories on the other half of the hill. And this is a ridiculous waste of land. And when you realize that Dunbar is a reasonably dull community because it doesn't have enough density, that the interior of Dunbar is uh, largely single-family houses, many of which are vacant, uh, it explains that NIMBY is alive and well. We also benefit from something called NIMTI, which is not in my term of office. Um, courage is uh, a very short supply in, uh, in the political sector and the ability to... Democracy is a combination of listening and not listening. So you have to be a very subtle purveyor of followership and leadership. And leadership is shutting off your hearing aid and charging ahead. Uh, we have not done that in all too many places uh, and not done what's right. We've uh, taken the political low road and I'll certainly say the province excels at that. Uh, restaurants, great outdoor restaurants, and if you are the purveyor of railings in Vancouver, you're going to get very, very wealthy. Uh, so yes, we glory in the, in the outdoors, uh, particularly if we can wall them off. Uh, and then pedestrians need to be very careful, and not just the bicycles and cars, but for a city that's dedicated to green, uh, we have no pedestrian streets, which I always find curious. So, in sum, we've done a lot, and I don't want to denigrate that. I do want to point out that we can't sit on our laurels, we can't get smug, which we've been doing, and we have to look to the future. So, what kinds of things can we do to have really vital and affordable and accessible cities? So, the three strategies I want to go over. The first one is we really need to energize the region, that anybody who's lived in a city of this size and other places knows that there's a lot more happening in a lot less structured way than seems to happen in Vancouver. So the three strategies I want to look at are energizing the urban region, uh, getting around our cities uh, with more certainty, uh, more economy, and more choices, and then looking at some innovations in land use, and particularly having flexibility. Uh, I'm going to illustrate these, lots of pictures. Uh, save you listening to a thousand words per picture, so we'll move ahead. Energizing the region. Uh, outdoor dining sidewalks, really are very popular in Vancouver. Uh, railings are also popular because the city requires them. I was stunned to find out from friends of mine who own restaurants that if you have an outdoor patio, you need a separate license. 
in addition to the license for your indoor restaurant. That's a great way to raise money. It's not a great way to raise activity levels. Uh, so outdoor dining, one of the things I think we really need to, to back off on and let people have a little more chance to pull chairs out on sidewalks. Uh, activating our waterfronts. Uh, we lived in Cold Harbor for 13 years, and Cold Harbor Park is a wonderful place for grass. It's not all that interesting for people. So we need to activate the waterfronts and get some things happening there, and certainly having street fairs and street markets as year-round activities that people can defend on should be the new normal and not as something that's special. It should just be part of what we do. So outdoor dining and sidewalk cafes, Paris is always the one that's uh, put up with good reason, but any place in Europe, and even as you'll see in New York, it's the same thing. Notice no railings, people spill out onto the street. Some people may even be in the roadway, uh, God forbid. But uh, they seem to survive. Uh, here's one from uh, Buenos Aires, same thing. The city is littered with these cafes. And then my home city of New York, I mean, it's totally uh, beyond comprehension here that people spill onto the street. They have no respect for order. They just seem to be having a hell of a good time. And um, I think we, we should al really allow that kind of serendipity and energy to happen. Waterfronts. Um, we have beautiful waterfronts, but they really are dull. Uh, when I came here in 1968, the only access to the waterfront was to illegally wander onto piers B and C that uh, Canadian Pacific had and take a look. Uh, I remember when I moved here, you could get homes. Our first home we looked at was on Point Grey Road on the north side of the road, a 25-foot lot with an old bungalow from the 20s, $25,000. There was no premium put on view uh, or water access, and I think we still have that to, to some degree. Um, so here are some of the things we could do. If you look at uh, Riverwalk in San Antonio, um, a place we lived for uh, two and a half years, Singapore, one of the more controlled places on the face of the earth. They allow people to populate the waterfront, and um, London has done great work on the Thames and, and opened it up to people and activity. The Danes, of course, being libidinous, would allow this kind of activity, so we, we don't want to follow them necessarily, but they're having fun too and hanging their legs over the water is clearly dangerous, violates some bylaw, but they're doing it anyway. <laughs> um, and even Baltimore, uh, one of the more challenged cities in the United States, has had enormous success with opening up its waterfront. The thing in common in all these places, you have activities on the waterfront, not just grass. And the Parks Board and the city of Vancouver have been very loath to imagine that a place like Cold Harbor Park could actually have restaurants and interesting kinds of retail opportunities, either uh, can't leave it out over the water or on floats. And all these cities allow that, and it certainly makes the places much more interesting and energized. Uh, street fairs. We, we have occasional street fairs. We celebrate them well beyond their worth uh, because there's so few of them. Uh, but here's one that takes place every week in London. There's a famous Petticoat Lane, um, one that's been going uh, since the 1890s in New York, Orchard Street, still going strong. They close the street and uh, merchants move their stuff out onto the street. Uh, a wonderful, famous street market in, uh, in Paris uh, that's open every day, and you can wander down there and, and buy your provisions fresh every day. And uh, my favorite of all is the Feast of San Gennaro in Italy, in Little Italy in New York every September, and they just close the street, and as you can see, mayhem breaks loose, and people have a very good time. Um, even cities like Toronto have an open-air flea market, and even Long Beach, the home of auto-oriented Los Angeles, uh, still has stuff that has people engaged on the ground, outdoors, and enjoying the good weather. So I think there's a lot we could do to uh, enliven and make the city more diverse and more interesting in those ways. When I look at getting around the city um, and uh, making spaces more enjoyable, uh, one of the things that we have not done, and I'll get into this a little bit later, is we, we seem to have let uh, traditional old uh, design-oriented physical architectural planning uh, lapse, and we spend much more time uh, dealing with policy issues, zoning densities, and the like. 
So when I look at places like um, New York as an example, but many other places where they have these mini parks, uh, pedestrian zones, uh, and huge swaths of the city where you can walk, uh, we have none of that here. Uh, the other thing in New York and here, uh, very long blocks downtown and in New York as well, and they have uh, all these blocks cut in half with buildings that go through uh, from one street to the other. In one case, these mid-block cuts go for six blocks, and I'll show you a picture of that. Um, urban waterways, pedestrian bike bridges, uh, we don't do any of that either in False Creek or out on the Fraser River. There are some little islands we could walk to. Don't do it in Steveston. There's no bridge across the Fraser from Queensboro that people can use, although there's some talk of getting one. Uh, commuter ferries. Uh, I use the one commuter ferry we have, but if we remember in the old days, uh, I think up till 1958, there was actually a ferry that ran from Dunderave to Jericho. Uh, so this is not a new idea. It's getting an old idea to work better. And many cities thrive on that. And have lots of photos. Uh, we need to desperately extend Rail Rapid uh, to Surrey Langley, Broadway, and out to Port Coquitlam. Um, that's a big ticket item, but it's a very cheap investment, and the quicker we make it, the more it's gonna pay dividends. And then we have a real oldie but goodie trolley cars. They're coming back. And uh, of course, in this city, bikes. So pocket parks, the most famous of the pocket parks is Paley Park in New York, which is about 40 years old. It's a tiny little side to a big office building, uh, and it offers you a really wonderful uh, quiet and a uh, place to get coffee and generally relax in and take time out from a very busy city. And this is a very busy part of the city. It's right near the Museum of Modern Art. Um, some other little parks, and there are a whole bunch of, of these that I could have put up, but they're all the same idea. They're very small, quiet, adjacent to big buildings, and the city invariably gives a bonus to people to build on that. And then pedestrian streets. Uh, I hope this shames the city, but it never has. Uh, Regina, uh, not one city we would normally think to emulate. Uh, it's got a mall, and quite a successful one. Uh, the Spark Street Mall in Ottawa is uh, getting a remake and getting some density around it, so it's going to be a pretty interesting mall that goes right through the center of, of Ottawa. Uh, one of the many pedestrian malls in London, this one in Shepherd Market in the Mayfair area. And then the one that astounded me most was the one on Nanjing Road in, in Shanghai. Um, this mall, this is the major street in Shanghai, and I spent lots of time in Shanghai uh, over the last years. I, I spent well, at least 40 or 50 trips to Shanghai. And this one amazed me because I hadn't been there for a year. And I go back and this mall is built and there's a little sign at the beginning and it says uh, this mall uh, was approved by the Shanghai People's Consultative Committee in August of XYZ and it opened in July a year later. Um, they demolished an enormous amount of commercial space to create this, and this, this pedestrian mall now runs for well over a kilometer in the most expensive real estate in the city. I had the same thing happened in Frankfurt. They took the major downtown uh, road and converted it to pedestrian use, and you see the same thing in, in any number of cities around the world, and it it's really makes for livability and it provides another very practical mode of getting around your feet. Uh, Mid-block walks, breaking up the, the long stretches of, of space. Um, this is, uh, again, a very old idea. Here's a famous one in Melbourne, built in 1859. Um, a beautiful one in Milan from 1865. Um, one in New York, uh, which has a mini park built into it. Um, this one goes back to 1816, so we're not talking path-breaking new ideas. Uh, the Burlington Arcade from 1819. And then this new mini street that they've developed in New York called Sixth and a Half Avenue, uh, which is between Sixth and Seventh. And it runs for six blocks, and the city bonuses developers who allow or encourage this mini street to go as a pedestrian street halfway between Sixth and Seventh Avenue. So they've been very, very successful uh, at creating weather protected spaces. Uh, great gathering spaces, and they really have 
have energized the city, and they are very, very busy. Um, pedestrian bridges, something, again, we have great opportunity to, to consider. Uh, we haven't done that to date. Um, here's one again. I'll take Calgary just to rub salt in our wound. Uh, another city we would never look up to. This is a rather expensive bridge built by Santiago Calatrava. Um, here's a cheap bridge made out of wood. Uh, built in Edmonton across the North Saskatchewan. Um, here's a bridge over the Yarra in Melbourne, and one of the most famous and busiest pedestrian bridges over the Thames, the Millennium Bridge connecting St. Paul's with uh, the Tate Modern on the south side of the river. So great opportunity to, again, uh, get better connections, give people an alternative mode of travel, and um, energize the place at the same time. Commuter ferries, we're blessed with being on the water. The beauty of commuter ferries is you don't pay for the right-of-way, you don't have to pay to maintain the right-of-way, particularly here where the right-of-way never freezes. So we have a great opportunity to look seriously at this, and TransLink did a study a while ago, uh, well over a decade ago, and concluded it wasn't feasible. But when you're talking about an agency that has no capacity to do any real estate development, no way to encourage the use of these ferries, it's not surprising they look at the cost side and say, we're not going to do it. But New York has this incredible water taxi service. Uh, one of the most famous and active is Circular Quay in Sydney, which really is the center of, a, of an enormous transportation hub. We have a potential to do that. The city is looking at that. I hope TransLink can be coerced into having ferries come all the way in from Port Moody uh, to do that. Seattle has an active commuter ferry. And then the favorite of all is the first class uh, commuter ferry, the Star Ferry, first class is 250 Hong Kong to sit upstairs, and that's about 35 cents. Uh, those ferries are close to 100 years old, and they're still ticking along, and they add interest, and they add redundancy to the transportation system. So in Hong Kong, you can always get where you're going because there are four or five modes that duplicate each other and allow you to always get there on time, independent of weather or traffic conditions. And then finally, Auckland has, again, a very successful ferry system connecting the outer islands and some of the suburbs. Um, an oldie but good idea, uh, streetcars. We abandoned them. We had a streetcar in the old days uh, that went to uh, Chilliwack, 1900, from Fourth and Alma. And uh, one of the things that company did was generate electricity. Uh, the BC Electric Railway found it was much more profitable to sell electricity, turned into BC Hydro, and then got out of the trolley car business going out to Chilliwack. So again, we're not talking about a new idea, and in fact, much of the SkyTrain right-of-way is old BC Electric right-of-way, which we had been too slovenly to redirect for another use, so it was still there for transit. And the streetcars are very comfortable, uh, they're accessible to people with disabilities, they're very, very attractive, and they're very, very economical. So I hope we uh, consider these seriously. And of course, one place we have been a leader has been bicycles, and we should continue that as part of a broad transportation diversifying strategy. And uh, really busy places like New York have pioneered this as well. In fact, we're following much of New York's lead uh, with bikes right through Times Square. Times Square is now a pedestrian zone. And um, if they can cut one of the busiest intersections in New York from traffic, we certainly can do something similar. And then last, getting some innovation in land use and getting some flexibility. I really believe we've got to get back to much greater regard for physical planning. Back in the, in the 50s, 1956 and 1962, the National Interstate Defense Highway Acts, uh, which built the interstate highways in the United States, allocated 3% of the capital fund for planning. And that was the beginning of modern planning schools, where they got away from physical planning and urban design, and they got into urban analytics. And the planning schools uh, have shifted overwhelmingly into that realm. And the few places where you still find urban design tends to be in architecture schools. I think uh, it's a great art. It would tremendously encourage uh, interesting experiences for people in our city and really get the lived experience uh, 
down on the street plane and make it much more enjoyable. All the things we talked about, these pocket parks and mid-block cuts, that's all possible. We also need to look at some old ideas. Again, the theme here is these ideas are not new. Uh, row housing, it's very difficult to get row housing because you have to set it up as a strata instead of setting it up as a fee simple. Um, and I think that's so simple we should be able to do that and it gives you a nice density bump. We also need some innovative building forms and I'll, I'll go over some of the ideas there. And then, God forbid, go to no zoning zones where somebody makes you an offer and they come in. Remember, zoning only started here in the mid-1920s. So things that were built before 1924 or 5 in the city of Vancouver were built without zoning. The city seemed to have some coherence and work. Um, maybe it's worth experimenting with that. Uh, I'm a huge believer in multi-story warehouses and factories. I am a huge unbeliever in uh, a, a land reserve for industrial land. Uh, there's no reason why you can't go up and have mixed use with housing, and I'll show some pictures of much higher density warehouses than we have, and generally really go for height and density at transit stations where we can dramatically increase supply and drop the total occupancy costs. So, I mean, here's some old ideas. This is on the, uh, now it's on the high line, but when I grew up in New York, these were active multi-story factory buildings with rail lines going right into them. Uh, they're still used in many cases as warehouses today, and um, some of them have been converted to uh, residential as well. Uh, Michael Geller will be pleased by this slide. Uh, some of the very innovative uses that are being made of shipping containers, and we have an example here as well with the Tira and it's uh, building on uh, Alexander, where they'd like to expand it. And then uh, my employer of uh, 40 years has pioneered the world's tallest wooden building, an 18-story wooden high-rise using uh, an innovative material wood uh, and one that is sustainable. So there's a great opportunity to allow more of that. Uh, but it's difficult to get innovation here. I remember when I was with Warren on the Emily Carr uh, on the Great Northern Way uh, campus that at the time BCIT wanted to experiment with sod roofs and do serious scientific study of the capability of using sod roofs and they had trouble getting a building permit from the city of Vancouver. And that's just stupid. And if you can't allow somebody even to experiment in the small uh, because it violates a current code, we're not going to make much progress in being an innovative uh, creator of land uses. Uh, the world's tallest logistics facility, just to be known as a warehouse, is uh, owned in half by the Canada Pension Plan. This is a 5 million square foot, 25 story logistics facility in Hong Kong Harbor. Um, it's extremely successful. It's big enough so two 53-foot trailers can pass on the ramp at the same time. So you can do it when land values get there, and our land values are getting there, and I don't why well, we don't consider more of that. Here's a multi-story warehouse in Brazil, uh, a lower level warehouse, but still three stories and one that makes much better use of the land. I have endless numbers of really dramatically uh, uh, good-looking buildings in Singapore, which you would have hard time telling me by looking at the building that it was a factory uh, because they spend a lot of time making them uh, very attractive and very functional. Uh, here's a mixed industrial residential development in Queens uh, in, in New York City. And here's an interesting little building in Surrey or in Sydney, BC, where it's a factory at the bottom, a sail loft, and it's a residence at the top. So on a small scale, very attractive, again, uh, encouraging this sort of thing, I think, will go a long way to blurring this distinction between employment land and residential land, which our city is so strongly wedded to. Uh, going back to townhouses, row houses, Georgian terraces, uh, over 200 years old, um, there's nothing wrong with that built form. And uh, as you can see, it can be quite dense. And here are newer variants in, in uh, the Netherlands. So, Again, it's hard to do that at Fee Simple in Vancouver, but it's well worth encouraging a, a more flexible ownership uh, and greater design of these kinds of land uses. So I, I have a, what I call the closing opening, and uh, I want to close but open up uh, some other ideas. And the principal theme is that 
There's nothing that we really need to uh, develop that's radically new. Almost all of these great ideas have been tried elsewhere. They've been very successful. And all we need to do is adapt them to the Vancouver uh, lifestyle and streetscape for the whole region. And there are lots of opportunities to do that. Uh, in Vancouver, we have problems with very high land costs. In Surrey, they have problems with the blocks being too big. And their challenge is how do you whittle it down and make it uh, a more uh, densely populated, uh, walkable city. And in our case, we have a problem with land being very valuable. And how do we get a better mix there. I think it was uh, shockingly stupid that the city banned housing in the urban core uh, because they were afraid we were going to run out of office land, uh, which is absolutely impossible because you just raised density. Uh, but that didn't occur to the folks at the time. Uh, so what I want to do is really say that the future is going to be built solidly on these oldies but goodies. Uh, so the palette of uh, ideas is, is well tried and true. Uh, and to the early professionals and, and students in, in the audience, you've got great stuff to work with and great opportunities to put them to work here to make Vancouver a, a much more active, energized, enjoyable city uh, in the lived life, not in the planned life. Uh, and given all tools and new ones which are being developed, you know, I think it's, it's not just uh, easily... Uh, available to do, but it's readily doable because you're not taking any risks. New ideas are always risky. These aren't new ideas. So that's it.